Welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi, welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined by my colleague, Raul Moaz. How's it going, Raul? Hey, doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. How is quarantine life treating you this week? It's good. We just started a learning pod, uh, and today was our day to host, so we had some kiddos over in the morning. And was it was it loud? Was it active? I'm sure that the kids are thrilled I'm, to... I'm be... really think I'm, I'm holding off on thinking about number two for a while now. <laughs> uh, we've got one kid, he's three years old, he's adorable, and he's so much more adorable when he's by himself. <laughs> I, I feel you. I think a lot of people feel that way. And, and of course, as you know, um, as a parent, um, it is, it's been a challenging time. And I know many of our audience members have felt that way. It's just such a, it is such a dynamic time um, with, yeah. with COVID-19 and we're dealing with so many um, issues, right? And, and that's really the point of Coast to Coast is really looking at the future of cities and really bringing um, real life um, topical issues um, to the forefront um, for our community of practitioners across the country. And so last week we looked at what does civic engagement look like during a pandemic, which was pretty interesting. You know, what, what are those different models of in-person engagement versus um, virtual engagement? Um, and this week um, we are talking with one of my favorite leaders and um, projects in Miami. So can you tell us a little bit about what we're, what we're gonna chat about today? Yeah, I'm super thrilled uh, to be part of this. So first of all, thank you for having, having me. Um, I'm thrilled to be chatting with a, a dear friend uh, who's also the, the CEO and founder of Friends of the Underline. And so Meg Daly uh, is the, the, the vision behind transforming kind of this underutilized kind of land, 10 miles of underutilized land below Miami's Metro Rail, the MPAC and turning it into a world-class kind of world-leading uh, public park, urban trail, linear park, uh, transit corridor. Um, and so uh, I love it for, for multiple reasons. One, she's an amazing person. Um, two, uh, she's, she's, she saw something uh, that others hadn't seen and that empath had been there for 30 something years more. Um, and she saw something and then and she went for it, right? And it's to yeah. me, so Miami, right? When we kind of the, the hashtag so Miami is usually used in a derogatory term. Um, but this is so Miami, right? That in Miami, uh, folks who have vision, folks who, who see something, want to build it, can go for it and can do it. Because uh, in our community, uh, the barriers for, for that kind of change are, are a lot lower uh, than in other places. So uh, Meg, welcome. We're thrilled to have you with us. Happy to be here. I'm also with two of my favorite people. So I love sharing time and space with both you and Lily. No, we appreciate that immensely. So uh, just to kind of tee it up for, for those who are joining us, uh, we're going to have a conversation with Meg for about 15 minutes. Um, and afterwards, we're, gonna, we're really going to save a lot of time for, for Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A box here directly in Zoom. Or you can, if you're watching on Facebook, you can uh, drop them in Facebook as well. Or if you're on Twitter, um, you, can, you can use that as well. Uh, so different platforms, different ways to kind of add, put a question out there. You can also use the hashtag night live to help us track that down. After uh, our, our discussion, uh, Lily's going to jump in. She's going to be curating these questions. And we're going to have a discussion with Meg on, on the things that you all uh, elevate for us. So uh, Meg, if, if you're good for it, let's drive in. Um, I think the, the first thing uh, is just to kind of help us set the context. Can you give us a little bit of, of a sense of what is the underline, first and foremost, really kind of quick synopsis there. And then when you think of resiliency, um, how do you define that? What does it mean to you? as it relates to, to you as a leader, but really you as the underline, you as this public space and this reflection of Miami. So what is the underline and, and how do you think of resiliency in the work you're leading? So the, what I love about Zoom is I can have this picture behind me and this is one of the renderings of the underline, which is a 10 mile linear park and trail below Metro Rail. Uh, right in the urban core, um, those 10 miles are very different by neighborhood. So I can be in Brickell, or I could be in Coconut Grove West Village, or I could be in Coral Gables. And the underline is mean, you know, sort of meant to be many things to many different people it serves. Uh, why did we start doing this? Um, you know, because Miami has some challenges in transportation and safety. Uh, it's one of the most dangerous places to walk and bike in the country. And we want to be part of the solution for that. And then you asked about resiliency. So we are 
really, this is all about sustainability. Uh, this is an urban reforestation project. It's um, trying to encourage people to take mass transit as well as walk and bike and make a beautiful experience for that. And then also I think, you know, gathering people together uh, is really important, I think, for the resilience of a community, um, something that we've all been struggling with as we've been in isolation. Um, and then I think resiliency of an organization is just a whole different conversation. There's just, uh, I love what you said there about kind of as we've been in isolation. I, I've never heard so many folks talk about and speak about public space as a determinant of social health, of community health, nearly kind of in terms of, of a human right um, uh, at the peak of, of, of social isolation here. How has that kind of, what, what has that meant for you, right? So what has the pandemic meant for you all in terms of residency? But there's downside to that for sure. I'm curious about how you're mitigating and managing against the, the headwinds and the downside, but also the tailwinds. Like what has this kind of uh, elevated? What has this accelerated, especially kind of in the public consciousness around people seeing public space in a different light? So I think a lot of us, you know, love our public spaces, but um, rarely put themselves in a situation of advocating for them. Um, the pandemic has showed us that this is not just nice to have, it's need to have. Uh, we have in Miami closed Ocean Drive uh, to making it pedestrian friendly, something that, you know, local advocates were, you know, really publicly wanted for years. It just wasn't until we got in crisis that we actually said this would be good for the community. Um, we've seen streets in New York uh, be closed. We've closed parking spaces so people can um, spill into the street and um, eat dinner, something also we never thought would happen. Um, and then we also have some, some metrics. Um, you talked about the impact when we started. That's currently the path below Metro Rail. Of course, the underline will completely transform that. Um, but that little counter has been measuring more than double the people using that little path um, because you know you have your family. How can I get outside? How can I move? I don't have my gym. I don't. So this is really this. People are saying they're clamoring for open spaces, and we heard a great expression recently, which is the outdoors is the new indoors. This is the <laughs> one safe place that we can be. And then you know, so will these? Will we advocate for these changes in lifestyle and mobility and the way that we connect with each other? Will they be long term changes that um, that leadership embraces? Especially kind of looking forward, um, there's some really tough decisions that lie ahead for communities, uh, regional governments, municipal governments in terms of budgets. Budgets absolutely are going to be under strain. In Miami, so much uh, revenue comes in um, through, through tax dollars, kind of hotel occupancy dollars that, that are driven by, by, by tourism, and that's taken a, a huge hit. And so when, when we think of organizational residency, which we had touched on originally, in the face of anticipated kind of budget cuts, anticipated kind of headwinds of that sort. At the same time that community is saying, we need this more than ever, right? We've got these countervailing forces that are pushing up against each other, hard decisions, budgetary decisions, community saying, we want this, we need this. How are you all thinking about that? How are you all thinking about positioning yourselves um, and, and, and to be resilient in the face of budget cuts, um, to be resilient in the face of, of increased demand? And I think that that's something that we always face, but um, more now than ever, um, you know, so our county, uh, the part, our partner uh, that we're building on county land um, and the county transit department and now parks department will be working, helping us with our governance uh, once we open the underline and we have quite a, almost all um, public funding for construction and then a combination of private and public funding for ongoing maintenance and management. I got to give you and your team a shout out. The Knight Foundation was one of our very first early believers. Um, when we open our basketball court, that will be in part thanks to your organization believing um, in our vision. Um, so that, I think that brings us to this tension of money and desire. You know, we want so many things, but there's only so much that can be paid for. And what I hope for is that when we come out of the pandemic and it's safe again to gather, that people remember this moment, mm -hmm. that they felt safe outdoors and they will continue to demand it. And I know that Lily and I, Lily and I have talked about this a lot. Like, where do you take your kids to play? And are we gonna take our playgrounds for granted now that you know we, we haven't had them for so long? Um, and then in terms of these, these budgets, 
Um, I mean, there are significant shortfalls, um, both at the county and the municipal level. I have to give a shout out to that, those leaderships to make um, a lot of things happen in these difficult times. Um, I think we're going to recover. The stock market already thinks so. Um, and, and once we recover, um, we have to remember our priorities. And our priorities are designing and building cities for people first. And once you embrace that, a lot of those decisions become very easy. Yeah, um, there's so kudos. Thank you for all uh, for, for all you do. Uh, kudos to our team and, 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 and partners and friends in government. Um, who I think oftentimes don't get enough credit for for enabling and and supporting these kind this kind of work. Um, so kudos because I think this has actually been an, an exemplary kind of public private kind of pump, uh, partnership um, that that I hope uh, inspires more and, and kind of uh, kind of generative in that sense. Um, there's uh, we, we you and I were together the other day uh, at the underline uh, checking out uh, construction. Um, I hadn't been in in that part of town in in a few months. Um, since quarantine started in March, um, and I can I can understand the difficulties in quarantining and social isolation because I was like, oh man, like I really want to stay here forever. I want to be outside <laughs> of my house for hours. I almost didn't go home for for a few hours. My wife was texting. She's like, where are you? I need help with a kid. Um, but it but it was it was incredible to see it right to actually see the underline um, coming coming into fruition. So I, I guess the, the one of the questions I, uh, I that I left with that day. I was like, I wonder what's going to happen to the psyche, the psyche of community. Now that they see that there was a promise made, um, they want this kind of public space more than ever before, and it's actually happening in, in the fall. Sometime in the fall, we'll, we'll be having phase one of, of the underline uh, opening up. And so have you gotten any early feedback from community as, as kind of the, the, the landscaping has gone in, as it becomes real, uh, as to kind of, oh, wow, like this is changing my view of what it means to live in the urban core in Miami and what's potential, what the potential is of that? Yeah, there's actually a number of buildings that directly connect to the underline, the first phase, uh, which is from the Miami River to Coral Way. Um, buildings like Neo Vertica, Reach and Rise. Um, there's a development um, by uh, Pinnacle as well, Mary Brickle Village. And all of those who are sort of looking out their windows, you know, they're seeing more and more, more, and more green every day as the plants fill in. Um, to the biggest surprise to me, was our area called the River Room, which is right by the river in Southwest 7th, which is sort of meant to be this sort of soft, loamy green space for you to walk your dog. And we had plants, so many plants that attract pollinators and butterflies that you go in there and it's like magic. It's like nature at work. While we were all staying home, um, nature was reproducing and very happy. So you experienced it. You saw the butterflies, the bees, the birds. I mean, people who said, there's no way that nature can grow underneath train tracks. It absolutely does. And, and you know, so when we, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden is one of our partners. I remember asking them, what's the success rate of our plantings going to be? And they said, you know, Meg, we're not really sure. Everything you're doing is an experiment. Um, so kudos to being a 10 mile lab. <laughs> I love it. Um, and thankfully it's working. Um, that, I, and that's what people are really excited about. Um, Miami-Dade County doesn't have a lot of, you know, dog parks available to people, particularly in the Brickell area. They're very excited about that. We've planned the first dog park in Coral Gables will be on the underline. Um, but it's also just this, this green space to connect, to walk, to bike. Um, in this rendering behind me, this is the area that connects to Southside Elementary, one of the oldest schools in Miami-Dade County. Those 800 kids can cross the street safely, get into the underline, um, you know, maybe even take Metro Mover, Metro Rail home. You know, so the promise that we made to the community um, to see it growing and coming to life is really inspiring to me. I, I left, there was multiple kind of sub questions. So when I, when I left the world, the first one was like, I don't think I, I ever recall seeing a monarch or any sort of butterfly in Brickle. And I saw a ton, right? Okay. Are, second of all, your milkweeds are uh, exceptional. Ours are like <laughs> totally dried out and not looking great. Uh, but yours are really looking good. So that was like the first thing I come out. I was like, oh wow, like there's, 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 there's actual life here. Like this is the native species that are coming back. Um, and then the second was like, you all, not, it's not just the, the, the actual public space and the, and the landscaping, but there's crosswalks now. I see it feels a lot safer across A Street at the MPAC uh, than before. So it's, it's also, uh, it's not just kind of beautifying the space, it's actually enhancing the space for pedestrians. 
Well, I thank you for that because um, the crossings are probably one of the more difficult um, implementations that we have. Um, you know, let's all be honest. Our city was built, um, it was a modern city. It was built for people to drive. And how do you retrofit uh, that kind of hardware? Um, and so our proposal is these very wide, bright green, no mo traffic movement as people are walking and biking. And, and we have a couple of um, little demonstrations, not little, they're substantial in Southwest 16th, 17th and 19th along US oh, yeah. 1. And, and people are getting really excited. Like this could actually change not just the underline, but other areas that uh, can throughout our county that can be safe to walk and bike as well as be greener. Um, you know, so there's a lot of areas that are, um, that are deserts and hot spots. Yeah. And so um, going back to resiliency, that's a very important part of our, part of our formula. Um, but before we run out of time, I, I did just want to um, talk about one thing that I don't want to forget. You know, when we open um, this fall, um, we're probably the largest park of our scale opening during a pandemic. So um, there are a lot of things we have figured out, but a lot of things we still need to figure out. So what's that 50 foot dining table going to look like? Um, how are we going to sit next to each other? How are we going to feel safe? Because we'll still be under pandemic conditions. And that's actually, you know, really increased the cost of, of maintenance. If you're constantly sanitizing, you know, to the tune of 20%. So again, you talked about this, this issue of budget shortfalls and constraints and also increase cost. So talk about that tension. That's something that, you know, we're really trying to um, figure out and, and also remain within our operating budget. I can imagine uh, you, 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 you're, you're better um, at keeping time than I am. Uh, this flew by. I, I did want to kind of touch on one thing before, uh, yeah, Lily, Lily will kill me if I go over time. Um, I, I do want to touch on one thing that's really important, right? And that is when we speak of resiliency, um, that means different things to different folks, especially based on, on socioeconomic status. Um, you mentioned that the underlying goes through very different kind of neighborhoods and it does go from all the way from Brickell all the way down to Dayland South. Um, could, could you give us a little bit of a taste of, of a couple things? One, um, kind of the, the neighborhoods that, that the underlying cuts through, they're not homogenous, right? So who, who does, who's affected by it? Who, who has access to it? Um, who can benefit from it, right? That's the first thing. The second piece is, as you think of, of, of resiliency, as you think of how Miami balances back, as you think of equity in resiliency um, and, and equity kind of being integral towards resiliency or not, or not being resilient, um, could you give us a, a taste of what you're all, you, what you're all thinking is um, for, for, for the benefits of the underlying being enjoyed by more people? And so does, does having a world-class public space in a neighborhood kind of further gentrify it? Does it increase development, displacement? How might we think of, of helping folks who are long-time residents in a neighborhood uh, that now all of a sudden is, is hot because it has this amazing kind of amenity uh, next to it. How might we think of keeping those folks in place? So residency through the kind of vis-a-vis -vis equity um, and, and who does the underlying kind of serve? You know, so um, to me, accessibility is equity. Um, and if you don't have access, then that's excluding people. And there's history throughout the country of policies so that people don't have access. Um, and that's another show that I'm sure you guys are going to have in the future. If you haven't already, I'm sure you've already explored that. We've touched um, on them a few, on a few episodes, yeah. Yeah, um, and so connectivity is very, very important. Um, one of the things we've looked at, and you, you know, we are part of the Highline Network, and we spend a lot of time looking at what the, the, the unintended consequences are of not planning for potential gentrification. Um, but since this project goes through eight transit stations, which are county owned properties and redevelopments, two of the stations already, um, at Douglas and Coconut Grove, um, have substantial opportunities for affordable housing, workforce housing baked into them. Um, we go through these very beautiful bedroom communities, um, Shenandoah, Silver Bluff, the roads, and those single family residential areas need to feel like the underlying servicing and then not threatening them. Um, but I think the connector points, uh, making sure that people coming off, you know, from Rickenbacker down 27th, 
um, feeding in Grand Avenue down to South Miami, which is we go now through two CRAs, that it's not just about looking at the green space, but how, how things are built next to it. And that's really another project unto itself. Um, one of the challenges we have as we go through those three municipalities, which their zoning codes, each one of them are very different. Um, you know, so we're really looking at how do we be part of, of making not just green spaces in our cities better, but how uh, allowing more people to live alongside them. Um, our, our first thought, and I know we, and I have to sort of summarize here, is to really look at something called soft density. So at the transit stations, we have very tall upzoned areas connecting to these single family homes that we think if you can sort of phase into them sort of quietly from the height into the lower buildings, it's much like little Havana did which has worked for a very long time. So two, four, six, eight story tops that phase into those neighborhoods so people don't feel threatened by height okay. and, and density. I appreciate that, thank you. So that's such a nuanced and kind of uh, custom uh, kind of uh, view on as it should be, right? There is no one set fits off for, for any of this work. Lily uh, has been curating some awesome questions uh, for us. So I want to bring her back into this. Um, wh where should we go next, Lily? What's, what are pressing burning questions folks have? Because yeah. uh, Meg dropped a bunch of gems here. Yeah, and, and no, this was such a good conversation. I mean, we, we've touched upon a, a, so many topics, um, and um, including around the equity piece and the engagement piece. So I want to dig a little bit deeper there um, and, um, and on, a, on a couple of levels. So, so there was a question around, um, around um, uh, operations and maintenance and, and kind of what, what that looks like. Um, and there's also a question around, um, around you know, the value increasing around which, which role you, you pointed out. Um, and so, so, so how are you thinking about um, capturing that value, Meg. Um, can you comment a little bit about, about, about that for the underline? You know, so there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I mentioned the Highline Network um, and those organizations, all infrastructure reuse projects throughout North America have said, we know that green spaces create value. I mean, look what happened at Central Park. I mean, all these great parks, the Highline, um, the values go up and everybody sort of hindsight 2020, what we failed was not capturing the value that we create in terms of not just economic activity, but real estate value. Right. Um, so we would like to do that. <laughs> yeah. And it takes time. It's a, it's a very, um, it's a very involved process, for, you know, considering the, the complexity of our makeup, which is municipal and county. Um, but we have some partners in place that will help us explore that. Um, but I did want to just, just ping back on the question of, of equity because I think equity is a, um, is a commitment that's, that's long term mm -hmm. and taking care of not just the people who live alongside the underline, but the people who work for us. Um, the organization that will be managing and maintaining uh, we'll have the li a living wage um, of over $17 an hour. Yeah. Um, we have um, SBA, which is small business, um, disadvantaged business requirements for the organizations that work with us. So we've been very self-reflecting. How are we taking care of ourselves, of the, um, of the people who work for us in the community that we serve? That's right. um, so equity goes, you know, there's lots of arms and legs to it. Um, and value capture that you mentioned is very important because um, there are very few um, foundations, um, people, families that want to pay for operations and maintenance for a green space. They love to have it, um, but they really feel like that's the realm of the, the public sector. So really the only way you can get that very expensive but very necessary piece paid for is through value capture, just capturing a, sl a sliver of the value that you've created and directing it back to operations and maintenance. And, bring, and putting it back into the community. So, so that, that's right, and, and putting it back into the, the, the underlying um, and maintaining, which is, which is really, really hard to fundraise for. A, a couple of comments there. Um, Carol Coletta, um, when I interviewed her, she said the exact same thing, Meg, where, where she said you, you, equity has to start with your organization. Uh, making sure that you're reflective of the, of the community and that you're treating your employees right, um, which will be incredibly important when we build out 
um, the, the management organization. Um, and then the second part that I thought was really interesting, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I talked with Dan Biederman, who of course is an expert in activating public spaces and, and value capture. And he said that he believes um, post pandemic that that value capture piece will be more important than ever because because you know we're seeing the demand for green spaces you know at, at astro astronomical levels and that will continue um, and uh, and the private sector will be will will be willing to 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 pay for that so just interesting um, thought there um, so a couple other questions I want to get to um, there's a question around um, how you're thinking about leveraging the arts um, uh, for the underline and and the activation there and the engagement piece there? So the underline is many layers. What you see behind me is trail. You see, I see the greenery and landscaping as another layer. Um, we haven't talked about the technology piece, which we're very excited about. Um, that's a layer that's connective tissue for the project. And we see art and, and we've had on our own, we, we did a little copycat Thing called Miami Voices because we were so inspired by Coast to Coast and we had a great group of artists talking about how um, treating the underline as a 10 mile outdoor art gallery um, with a combination of, of local, uh, national, and international artists. Um, the curator for that um, is Jimena Caminos um, from Faena. I have to give her a shout out. Um, she's also pro bono, um, as am I. I'm a full-time volunteer. Um, so it, I think it really shows the power of our volunteerism, but the artists um, came into our project early through a grant from Art Place America. We had four installations that were temporary. We had so much exciting, excitement around that because there was no one who sees the world like an artist does. And the way they express a space is so different than I would see the world or the two of you would. And so they are they are baked into the vision of the underline is that 10 mile outdoor gallery. Right, right. I th I, the, the arts piece is just gonna be fantastic. And of course there's there's overlap with the technology piece too. Um, so, so, so Meg, there's, there's a question around um, building upon this momentum with the underline. I mean, of course the, the underline has has been, you know, one of the most premier um, public space projects in in Miami Dade, um, arguably also in the country, um, thanks thanks to your leadership. Um, but but there's also a question about what about other green spaces? What about the the you know we can think about it as a corridor, but also a spine, you know, and and how can we and, and a network um, for for other green spaces and and um, and I and I do want to say before you answer this question, what I think um, you've done such a, a good job of when we talk about the underline is is that this isn't a zero sum game um, that we can we can think about investing in the underline and also elevating you know um, green spaces all over Miami Dade. So would love to hear your your thoughts on that. First about the um, Miami-Dade County, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Um, and the underline uh, was one of the many trails um, that they've mapped for the county to really improve countywide access for walking and biking. And they had a couple of great articles, but one specifically about their blue ways, so there's green ways. Meg, we lost you for a second. Okay. I think we might have roll. Do you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, At first perfect. I thought I did something. I was like, oh, yeah. am I looking so attack? I, 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 I think we lost. Yeah, I think we I think we lost Meg. Um, we are one minute um, short of one thirty. Um, but but to me, this has been a really really fantastic conversation um, that um, that really makes me so proud of of what's going on in Miami, and I think a lot of organizations can can learn from what's happening. Any any takeaways that you had? Um, I couldn't agree more. I think I feel a sense of pride seeing it. I, I, it was it was a really awesome privilege. Uh, this, this last couple of weeks, I was able to kind of see kind of this intermediate phase where, where it's at. So it's, it's actually real, it's happening. Yeah. I think that's gonna do a, a ton for for the city and for community in terms of changing the psyche. And I think the, the other takeaway, I think, I think we're gonna get greedy in a good way. I think community mm. is gonna say, this is what world-class public space does, how it feels, um, mm. what it means to us and how it changes our community. 
And I think in the same way that the arts and the investments my, uh, Miami has made in the arts for the last two decades have changed the way that community appreciates the arts and wants more of it, I think the underline is going to do that for, for public space. I think this is going to be the reference point that, that a lot of folks point to uh, in, in the coming years and say, no, we want more of this. This is the level of excellence that we expect in, in our community. Absolutely. Meg, um, I, I, was, I asked uh, Rule what was his favorite thing that he learned today. Um, did you have any closing? Did you want to finish your thought? Um, and then we can, we can close out our conversation. Sure. I'm back, right? Yes, you're back. <laughs> okay. this, is, this is the reality that we live in. <laughs> I'm sure everybody forgives us. We do yes. this five times a day. Um, yeah, so the, the, there are big visions. Um, mm -hmm. Implementing a big vision is very difficult. It's also very expensive. Um, and I want to go back to um, investment. Um, and I think we need to look at the money we spend as an investment and not just an expense. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I have is, why would we invest all this money for construction if we don't in have an investment plan for ongoing operations and maintenance? So that's yeah. back to your value capture. Um, but I think that the, uh, that the speed and the momentum of this project has really inspired and sort of lifted all these other great projects up, including Ludlam Trail, yeah. which we connect to on the south end, the Miami River Greenway, uh, the Bay Walk, the Rickenbacker project called Plan Z, and then all the many spurs off of that. So people are, oh, there's also a great project Commodore Trail. Yeah. So this is not, so our sandbox has gotten much bigger. Um, the demand for these projects, um, I think our voices are louder. Yeah. Um, and I hope that that continues. We, ins we inspire this throughout the community that, that a champion, one champion, but can do a lot, but more can do more. Yeah. And so I think all of us need to um, sort of lead the charge. I would say that we do have this, if you haven't seen our really cool underline mask, um, they were designed by Hamish Smythe of Order Design. And, um, and if anybody makes a donation of $50 or more, you'll get an underline mask. They're very comfortable. Um, and you can get one at the underline.org uh, forward slash support. And we just link to it in our chat in our um, Q and A chat box, so um, so folks can can get it there. With that, we are over time. Thank you, Meg, um, and and thank you, Raul. Um, this was a great conversation, and I think that, like I said before, I think our audience really learned a lot um, about what it what it takes to continue to be resilient um, during this pandemic and also post pandemic. Um, and I'm just so excited to to use the underline um, very soon um, this fall. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. Um, and next week, um, Roel, I think you're going to be really interested in this one. Um, we'll be talking with the leading expert on leveraging public spaces and park spaces for schools um, cool. and how we can be how we can be can thinking about yeah, I know. Can you take my toddler? Yes. <laughs> yes. And so how we can really keep our schools open, but really leveraging public spaces. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that conversation. And we'll see you next Tuesday at, at 1 p.m. Eastern. Take care. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.